Okay, well, my, my mother taught me that uh, you can always make lemonade out of lemons. So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the great news. Um, so the, the keynote speaker for this event, General Bolden, um, the, uh, the uh, chair of, of NASA, um, was going to be with us today uh, to be our keynote speaker, but um, he uh, found out just a couple of weeks ago that uh, he was called to the Pentagon on this day and couldn't uh, reschedule those. So uh, we actually have a video of his talk. For anybody who wants to stay and watch General Bolden on video, you're more than invited to do so. For all of you who are absolutely starving, because as you note, we are very far over schedule, you're more than invited to um, go out to the deck and um, join us for a barbecue lunch. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, I will just uh, introduce uh, General Bolden to you for those of you who do want to stay and watch the video. Um, as we are uh, involved in the world of academia, General Bolden um, has literally circled the globe and actually been out of this world. Um, he has taken um, four uh, trips um, uh, into space, um, two of which he commanded. Um, he has a long and distinguished career as a, in the Marine Corps, um, with over 34 years of service, flying 100 combat missions in North and South Vietnam, Laos, Cam and Cambodia. Um, he uh, is also a champion for public health. Um, he joined the Harvard School of Public Health's Advanced Leadership Program, which is a fellowship program um, aimed at experienced leaders who want to devote future efforts to significant public service. And his goal uh, in being part of that program was to improve healthcare services for people suffering from sickle cell disease. Um, he, um, I'll tell you one just kind of funny story about him. He's kind of an amazing character. Um, when he called to apologize for the fact that um, he was called away to, uh, to the Pentagon and wasn't going to be able to with, be with us today, um, he actually uh, spontaneously called me at 7 o'clock at night and he said, and, and I picked up the phone and he just said, there was this voice on the other end that said, Roberta, this is Charlie. Um, I'm sorry I'm calling you so incredibly late, but it's been a busy day. The, the shuttle launch has been scrapped. <laughs> and I was just sitting there with my mouth hanging open going, first of all, who's Charlie? <laughs> and then when I realized what had happened, you know, I thought, I cannot believe this man has just taken time out of his day on the, literally the day that the shuttle launch, launch was scrapped to, um, to call me and tell me this. So um, in lieu of his being here, um, we'll show you what he would have said were he with us here today. Good late morning or good afternoon, whichever it is. Uh, I am very pleased to be with you, if, if not in person, uh, sort of in, in virtual presence. Let me thank uh, Dean Ness very much for allowing me to be with you today. Uh, I do apologize for not being able to be there in person. Uh, I was looking forward to congratulating uh, Dr. Larry Kaiser on, on his assumption of the presidency, which I realized was quite some time ago. Uh, here at the Health Science Center, but, but I had a privilege of meeting him at a luncheon when he came in town to interview uh, a little bit more than a year ago, so I wanted to congratulate him in person, but, but uh, Dr. Kaiser, congratulations in, in my absentia. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you on this uh, occasion of the 40th anniversary of the University of Texas School of Public Health, and I wanted to uh, share with you just some thoughts, if I can. I know you've been discussing things in the symposium this morning, and you're going to be very busy this afternoon. But a few thoughts on, on the issue of public health uh, in the 21st century. Uh, as the NASA administrator, uh, I am privileged to lead a group of people around the country and actually around the world who, although you might not think about it, but are involved in public health every day because we operate something that's called the International Space Station. Uh, it is a conglomerate, if you will, of uh, a number of different nations, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, and NASA, along with other non-aligned nations that uh, come together in a national laboratory, is what we call it. Uh, I was talking with, uh, with Sean Bauer, who was so, so pleasant and so persistent in, uh, in helping me to arrange this opportunity to speak to you on, on videotape, and we were sharing together some of the thoughts about how uh, actually how closely NASA and the School of Public Health here actually are. Um, we worry about our environment on the International Space Station, which is a little city. And many of the same issues that uh, you all deal with as public health professionals 
uh, we deal with as, as professionals in our own little city public health on the International Space Station. Uh, and when we think about going to another planet or to another heavenly body, the moon or Mars or even a near asteroid, uh, we have to think about the same types of issues that you do. Uh, you're concerned about pandemics. You're concerned about disease and the spread of disease. We do the same thing when we get a, a shuttle crew ready to go fly. We actually put them into quarantine 10 days prior to the mission because we want to make sure that they don't, uh, they're not carrying any childhood diseases, simple things like measles and chicken pox that could ruin their day for a, for a flight into space. So we look at many of the same issues that you do. Uh, today, because of the factor of radiation and its effect on the human body, uh, as we talk about going to another planet, uh, that becomes an issue with us, and it is a public health issue. Uh, frequently, you all will talk about, you may not talk about it directly, but you're worried about the ozone layer and you're worried about people's exposure to the sun and the like. Uh, from the standpoint of radiation, that's exactly what we're concerned with as we think about taking humans from this planet, our, our home planet Earth, to any other heavenly body in our solar system. So radiation becomes a significant issue. Uh, women's health issues are, are very important for us because we find that a larger and larger proportion of the astronaut uh, community today are women. Uh, the other area that, that we look at and you do also is uh, that of public health for underrepresented minorities. Uh, I will tell you that I think it is going to become an even greater issue for you because organizations or groups of people that we consider today to be underrepresented minorities uh, in the very near future will actually represent the majority of our populations. So diseases and ailments that we kind of put on the back shelf before uh, will become significant issues uh, for those of you who are public health officials. And in talking with Dr. Ness in preparation for this, she mentioned to me that, that the, the UT School of Public Health is really has a, a number of new initiatives that look at these types of things. So I think uh, the collaboration that's possible between NASA and all of you in the public health community is incredibly important. Uh, we are always looking at, at the environment aboard the space shuttle, the environment aboard the International Space Station. Uh, we're looking at pathogens and we're looking at any kind of thing that can affect the, the healthful life of, uh, of a person who is visiting any of our spacecraft. So uh, I think there are a lot of things that, that we have in common and that we do the same. Uh, some of the other challenges that I think uh, that I think about when, when I think about public health, one of my favorite, uh, because I happen to be uh, passionate about it, is a disease called sickle cell disease. Uh, it is something that because it represent, because it affects such a small, a relatively small portion of, uh, of our society, at least here in America, we tend to put it on the back burner and there's not a lot of attention that's paid to it. Uh, I think this will become a significant issue in the years ahead. And here in the Houston area, it is becoming even more important as we find that uh, every once in a while we come across a case of sickle cell disease in, in a Hispanic member of the population, or we've even had some cases that have come up in, in uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, a portion of the community that we thought this disease would, would never affect. So um, as you go through your deliberations this afternoon, uh, as you have done this morning, I hope that you'll think out of the box and you'll think about some of the, some of the emerging challenges uh, for the public health community and that you will try to find ways to, uh, to attack those challenges and try to get ahead of it before it does affect the population in general. Um, I, I, want, I know you're trying to get off to eat, so I, I will not be very long, but, but in closing, I want to share a story with you that I think uh, we can all learn from. And it's a story about a young man uh, who died at the age of 12. His name is Nikosi Johnson. And some of you, if, you, if you're like me and you're a, you're a fan of National Public Radio, then, then you have heard about Nikosi through the years. Nikosi was born in a place called KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, in a little village. And he was born with AIDS because his mother had been stricken with AIDS by uh, her husband who had the disease. Uh, her mother died, his mother died shortly after his birth, but she had uh, asked a, a, a white woman by the name of Gail Johnson if she would take care of her child. Uh, Gail adopted Nikosi, and over the years of his very brief life, they started traveling around South Africa and then around the continent of Africa, eventually around the world, crusading against the dreaded disease AIDS. Um, and Nikosi became world-renowned uh, on shows like Larry King and, uh, and other shows like that here in the United States. Um, and he was famous because he always had a huge smile on his face, a broad smile. Everybody always talked about his beautiful white teeth as they protruded from his tiny little face. 
Uh, they could see that he was racked by the disease. They could see that he was in pain, but he never expressed any. Uh, he never expressed any any anything about his pain. Never complained. Never asked anybody for anything. But traveled around the world, motivating other people to do things. An American writer by the name of Jim Wooten, who reports for National Public Radio, heard about this young man, and he traveled to South Africa to meet with Nikosi. Uh, he was so impressed with him um, as he talked to him, and he said, Nikosi, you know what? What motivates you? What makes you do what you do? Nikosi told him, you know, I, I may be black, I may be poor, I may have AIDS, but we're all the same. And those words became the title of the, uh, the biography of Nikosi Johnson that Jim Wooten wrote when he came back to the United States. A couple of days later, a couple of years later, Jim heard that Nikosi was, his condition had worsened and that he was probably going to die within days. So Jim jumped on an airplane, flew back to South Africa, uh, where he went and met Nikosi, who was lying on his deathbed. There he was at, at the age of 12. He weighed about 20 pounds. Uh, Jim said you could actually see the bones protruding through his, uh, up under his skin and the big smile, though, on his face. And, uh, you could, it was obvious he was in pain, but Nikosi still smiled, and he talked about things that needed to be done for his community and for the AIDS community around the world. And Jim said he just got, he got uh, emotional, and he said, I don't understand you. He said, um, you know, you're going to die. And he said, Nikosi said, yep. He said, but you could die today. And he said, Nikosi said, yep. He said, well, I don't get it. You know, you don't complain. I have known you now for two years. Other people who have known you for all 12 years of your life say that you are always encouraging other people. You've become a motivational factor around your village and around the country and now around the world. What makes you tick? And he said, Nikosi kind of looked up at him with his sad little eyes and smiled. And he said, you know, uh, I believe you do all you can with what you have in the time that you have in the place that you are. So my message that I would leave with all of you uh, today is think about what Nikosi said. And as public health professionals, uh, remember that our job is to serve other people. Uh, it's to try to find ways to make life better for other people and to make our communities stronger uh, help in from a health standpoint. So do all that you can with what you have in the time that you have in the place that you are. Thanks so very much for allowing me to spend some time with you. I do apologize again that I'm not there in person, but I do hope that I can get with this community uh, sometime in the future to share some, some of your experiences and, uh, and get you to understand how closely you, you, you work with us at NASA, whether you, whether you know it or not. Thanks so very much.